What's up gamers, Dreamcast Guy here, talking today about Final Fantasy. This series has been going on for over 20 years, and a lot of people have been asking lately, where do I begin? With Final Fantasy XV coming out right around the corner, many people want in on the series, but they just don't know which game to play first. So I'm going to be going over Final Fantasies 1 through Final Fantasy X, talking about the cool things and the not so cool things about all the games, so you know which one you should try out. I'm also going to be going over the best version of each game, because many of these have been released many times over throughout the years. If you'd like to skip to a particular game, in the description box down below, there's going to be timestamps. You can just click on the game you want and skip right to it. But now let's jump in with the original Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy 1, the game that started it all. Released originally on the Nintendo in 1990, we play as four heroes setting out on an adventure to save the world in some cool turn-based combat. The original NES version of this game actually has some pretty bad glitches and the translation isn't the best. Lucky for us, they corrected these errors in the 2004 re-release Final Fantasy Dawn of Souls on the Game Boy Advance. This is a totally new translation with better graphics and added secret dungeons that you can play after the end of the game. I personally think that the best version of the original game though is released on the PSP, Final Fantasy Anniversary Edition. It has amazing graphics with lots of hand-drawn characters and enemies and a totally remastered soundtrack. The PSP version also uses the corrected translation from the Game Boy Advanced re-release and includes all those special new dungeons. Gameplay in this game unfolds in your standard RPG style. Two groups take turns hitting each other with weapons and magic until the enemy group dies so you can gain experience and levels. At the opening of the game, you choose what class your four heroes will be. Each class wears different gear, uses different weapons, and casts different spells, so I highly recommend you look into each class before you choose, because if you build a bad party balance, it might screw you in the end. Exploring all the elemental dungeons and beating this game is still really, really good, but it is a little bit flat storyline-wise, so you may not want to start with this game until after you've beaten a few other Final Fantasies, but even after all these years, the original is still a lot of fun. Final Fantasy 2 this game wasn't even released in America until 2003, with the release of Final Fantasy Origins on the PlayStation 1. When I'm saying Final Fantasy 2 here, I'm referring to the original Final Fantasy 2. The version of Final Fantasy 2 we got in America is actually Japanese Final Fantasy 4, but more on that later. Final Fantasy 2 is probably the strangest in the entire Final Fantasy series. The leveling system will probably remind you a lot of Skyrim. Instead of turn-based combat just giving you direct experience and gaining levels, you instead level up individual skills. For example, if you use your sword a lot, your sword ability will level up, giving you heightened attack power with that particular weapon. If one of your characters uses spells a lot, then their maximum amount of mana will increase so they can cast more spells in the future. Or if you take a lot of damage, your maximum health will increase. The gameplay and combat in this game is interesting, but rather frustrating at times, mostly due to the fact that to level your health, you are eventually just going to have to sit in fights and get punched a lot until your health pool levels up. The best version of this strange entry in the series is the PSP release or the Game Boy Advanced version included in Dawn of Souls. I don't recommend trying this game first, mostly because it's not a very good representation of how great this series gets later on and how complex the combat systems can be, but if you're a diehard fan, definitely look into this sometime. Final Fantasy 3 This game brings back the class system introduced in Final Fantasy 1, but now we can change classes whenever we want. Each class levels up on their own, gaining unique skills, and as we progress through the story, we're going to unlock more and more classes we can play as, keeping you interested in driving you to the depths of the next dungeon. This game was originally released on the Nintendo Famicom in Japan, but we didn't even get it in America until 2006 with the remake coming out on the Nintendo DS. The story of this one is extremely straightforward, the gameplay is really straightforward, and the dungeons are strangely simple. I think the biggest plus of this game is the art style. Seeing this cool, kind of more cartoony look really fits well with the Nintendo DS or on the PSP. If you're looking for a really easy Final Fantasy to play first, you may look into this game, because right now it's pretty cheap and honestly it'll probably be the easiest one you can tackle. Final Fantasy 4 
this is where the series really got taken to a whole new level of storytelling. Millions of Final Fantasy fans were first introduced to the series by this game. Released in America under the title Final Fantasy II on the Super Nintendo, it has a much darker and complex story than many gamers had ever experienced prior to its release. We are taking the role of Cecil, a dark knight working for an evil, power-hungry empire. Throughout the game, we're going to be finding which path to goodness we can take and how much can you even find goodness in a world being torn apart. What really makes this game stand apart from all the other Final Fantasy games is its cast of characters. Throughout the game, you'll have people joining and leaving the party depending on different storyline elements, and each character that joins has different spells and combat abilities. This makes each dungeon a unique challenge because you're not just trying to learn the dungeon, but also learn your new party members, level them up, get them specific gear, and conquer the next boss. This mechanic of characters joining and leaving the party as you traverse through the game actually really pulls you in even more, because you're going to learn to love characters. You're going to get attached to strange characters that you thought you would hate, only to see them leave and have new people join. This game started on the Super Nintendo, but was later ported to the PlayStation, although I must say this is the worst version of the game, and you should not play that if you plan on playing this game. The Game Boy Advance remake they did, called Final Fantasy IV Advanced, corrected many of the plot holes they accidentally made in the initial Super Nintendo translation, along with sharpening the graphics. There are two really incredible versions of this game, though, that I think are tied as the best versions of Final Fantasy IV. There's the Nintendo DS remake, which impressively rebuilt the entire game from the ground up with full 3D animations and voice acting, but the downside is the remake is extremely hard. All the enemies were given more health, hit harder, and every area can be incredibly harsh while you're trying to do your initial exploring, but it actually makes it a lot more fun when you're able to beat it. If you're looking for an experience that's kind of a modern day version of the original Super Nintendo experience, then you definitely want to look into the PSP version called Final Fantasy IV The Complete Collection. This has improved art, remastered music, and also includes a lot of additional content, including a whole additional game that takes place after the credits called The After Years, following the character son decades after the initial story took place. If you're looking for a good example of how awesome classic Final Fantasy was, I highly recommend you check out Final Fantasy IV first. Final Fantasy V the class system from Final Fantasy 1 and Final Fantasy 3 returns in Final Fantasy V. This is called the job system and it really takes full form in this game. Each job levels up independently, but earning ability points in battle gives you the option to keep certain skills when you switch classes. This brings a cool customization element to your characters. The ability to blur character lines, to create a warrior who's good at healing, or to create a caster who's good at beating the crap out of people. That's the fun of Final Fantasy V. The story in this game is much more straightforward than Final Fantasy IV and has a much smaller cast of characters. This is probably the most grind-heavy of all the Final Fantasies, though. Since you only have five characters, but they have so many different abilities they can learn, you're going to be switching classes, leveling up, and trying to figure out how much you can really customize them. The best version of this game is definitely the Game Boy Advance version, Final Fantasy V Advanced, which actually fixes a lot of technical errors that the original Japanese version suffered from. If you're able to track down a Game Boy player attached to your GameCube, it's really cool to be able to play this game on your TV or pull it out, put it in your Game Boy, and play it on the go. I recommend you play Final Fantasy V after you've beaten a few of the other Final Fantasies, because it doesn't really have the best representation of the storylines, and overall the grinding can get a little tedious. But Final Fantasy V is fun in its own unique way. Final Fantasy VI as soon as you hear the opening soundtrack and see these mechs marching across the frozen tundra, you know Final Fantasy VI has earned its fame as one of the best Super Nintendo games ever created. Many people to this day even debate that it may be one of the best games in the entire Final Fantasy franchise. Although this is called Final Fantasy VI in Japan, here in America it was released as Final Fantasy III on the Super Nintendo, so if you see a cartridge labeled that, definitely scoop it up. A lot of qualities of this game are extremely unique for an RPG. First of all, it has a female protagonist, which is really rare in Final Fantasy, but the heroine Terra really fills this task wonderfully. The game also features the biggest permanent cast of playable characters, with a whopping 14 people that can be switched in and out of your party throughout the game. 
One of the things that's the most famous about Final Fantasy VI, though, is that it has a truly insane bad guy. I mean, literally, he's not sane, he's bonkers. Kefka, the mad clown general, with dreams of becoming a god. Before this game, most of the antagonists in Final Fantasy had been very distant evil creatures. People who would show up towards the beginning of the game, scare us, and then remain unseen until the final battle. But Kefka was totally different. He loves to taunt us, to flaunt his power, and generally enjoys the reckless destruction his magic creates. I don't want to give any spoilers about this game, but I think Final Fantasy VI has one of the best stories of all time, and definitely look into it. All the versions of this game are really good, but I think buying it on the PlayStation Network was the best for me because I could play it on my PlayStation Vita or transfer my save file and play it on the TV with my PlayStation 3. I highly recommend this as one of the first games in the series to play, especially if you're interested in the 16-bit era of the Final Fantasy series. The art and music, though, are just too incredible to cram onto a tiny screen, so if you're able to play it on a version that's on your TV, please do because you will not regret it. Final Fantasy VII. What can I really say about this game that hasn't already been said? It's incredible. What makes Final Fantasy VII so unique and so loved by fans is that it's not just telling one story. Every character that joins our fight to save the world has their own personal demons that they must carry out and slay throughout the course of the game. Cloud dealing with his lost memories and trying to find out what's the point in even fighting. Red 13, dealing with years lost in a lab and never knowing his true family. Aerith, being the last of her kind and not even knowing the importance of what that means. Even the world-destroying, death-transcending monster, Sephiroth, has his own dark path he walks throughout the course of this game. Even the opening of this game sets the tone for how chaotic this world is. You are performing a terrorist act, blowing up a power plant, and we realize how twisted this world is. Even this massive act of evil that's costing so many lives is considered a good deed in this warped land they live in. The harsh ambience of the game is really strong in Final Fantasy VII. It was one of the first games that had heavy ambiance all throughout it, mostly due to the fact that it was the first game on the PlayStation, so they were able to do full motion video and really set a heavier graphical tone. The combat in this game is focused around what's called the Materia System. You equip magic and special abilities directly into your gear, and that gains experience as you level. Along with giving you extra attacks to use in combat, Materia can give you stat bonuses. This really gives combat a lot of weight, because you want to level up your weak Materia and make it stronger, but you also need enough high-level spells equipped and on hand to live through the tougher fights. Playing through these three discs of stories, side quests, and item collecting takes time, but you'll love every moment. Obviously, the graphics have aged very poorly, leaving our characters kind of looking like mouthless LEGO action figures, but if you struggle past it, there's actually a really good story behind this that makes it one of the best in the series. If you play this game on PC, fans have made stellar mods that improve the graphics and really improve the character models so they don't quite look so blocky. This might be tied for my favorite game in the entire Final Fantasy series, so if you can get past those ridiculous graphics, grab a copy and hunt down that bastard Sifroth before he destroys the world. Final Fantasy VIII Playing a Squall at the start of the game is a very strange experience because he's a mostly silent protagonist. He's not interested in interacting with the other characters, but as you play through Final Fantasy VIII, you see his struggle unfold and you truly begin to love Squall for what he is. In this game, you're a member of a military school called C, but instead of just teaching the normal subjects like math, science, and magic, they actually send students out on deadly missions. This is by far my favorite part about Final Fantasy VIII being hired for assassination quests, trying to meet agents out in the field, running on top of trains, all for a paycheck and good grades is so surreal. In fact, surreal is the best word to sum up Final Fantasy VIII because the story is so out there, it's almost impossible to explain, especially towards the end when reality itself begins to unravel. Combat in this one is a little bit more complicated. You're going to be using the draw command in combat to extract spells from wild animals, and with this you can actually use these spells against enemies or equip it. For example, if you draw a fire spell out of somebody and then equip it into Squall's Gunblade, he'll now have elemental fire damage with every attack. But on the other side of the coin, you can equip it into this furry fluffy jacket he wears and you'll now be immune or even absorb fire attacks. 
This combat system frustrates some because you can only cast spells that you've pulled out of enemies, and it ends up making you have to harvest spells whenever you run into good ones, and you sometimes have to go to bad areas to get good spells. Upgrading weapons is also quite a bit different in this game. Instead of just going to a shop and buying a better weapon, you're actually finding weapon magazines that explain how to construct a better weapon and then finding screws, bolts, glue, that sort of stuff to improve your weapon yourself. It's kind of a strange mechanic, but I really enjoy stuff like that. The fact that Final Fantasy VIII is so out there and so different from the rest of the series actually makes it one of my favorites to play whenever I'm having an off day. I recommend this to be your third or fourth Final Fantasy to play. It's damn fun, but you have to understand a lot of Final Fantasy concepts before you try and tackle that strange combat system, and I think it may turn off a lot of fans to the amazingness of this crazy series. Final Fantasy IX Seeing the more cartoonish art style makes people typically think Final Fantasy IX is a kiddish entry in the series, but it's actually one of the darkest games ever. You're taking the role of Zidane, Master Thief, on a quest to kidnap the daughter of Queen Brawn before getting mixed up in a terrible quest to save the world. This game features some impossibly massive destruction. You'll visit towns, talk to people, really learn about them, only to see the entire city completely consumed by dark gods later in the game. War is the center of this tale, seeing nations rip the world apart piece by piece for power, resources, or just a greater reach. Many shots in this game are more dramatic than any other in this series. Like this scene you're seeing here, our heroes have been pounded into the very dirt beneath their feet by an overwhelmingly powerful foe. Laying in the rain, gasping for breath, clinging to life as their enemy just casually mounts his dragon and flies away without a care. That's what this game does well. It really shows you the futility of fighting such massive evil. Final Fantasy IX has a lot less world map than previous games, with most of the story taking place as you're wandering through linear zones, and saves most of the major world-spanning side quests for after you get an airship towards the end of the game. The combat in this game is my favorite in the entire series. Each piece of equipment you put on has a skill imbued inside it, and while wearing it, you can use that ability temporarily. If you do enough, though, you'll gain enough ability points to keep that skill permanently and no longer need to wear it to cast that spell or use that ability. The skills are really interesting as well, because they're not just always attacks. Sometimes there are these things you can equip. Equipping these skills dramatically changes how battles can carry out. Some of them will increase your attack power, or make it where a spell costs double mana but also does double damage, or even the ability to automatically revive yourself upon death. I love this combat and leveling style because it keeps you searching for the rarest items in the world. It keeps you looking for the rarest spells in the world to try and crush these powerful bosses, including some secret bosses that are harder than the last boss that really test your skills. Like Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VIII, your best bet for getting this game is finding it cheap on PlayStation Network. It goes on sale quite a bit, so I'm sure you can get it for cheap. If you're looking for a game that has good story and less wandering around the world map, definitely pick this one up first. Final Fantasy X. This game has full voice acting, beautiful visuals, a story that is certain to make you cry, and a soundtrack that I personally think is the best of any RPG ever, and they all add together to make Final Fantasy X so insanely good. We're following the tale of Titus, a professional sports star thrown a thousand years into the future where mankind has gone back to a more tribal state of existence. A massive monster named Sin by the church has been wreaking havoc across the land with no way of being stopped. Mankind believes that their reliance on technology made them lazy and now the gods have created Sin to punish them. Because of this, they now live in small groups, mostly farming or fishing communities, and pray each night that Sin will not choose to consume their village. The only known way to stop Sin is to have a summoner travel from village to village praying at all the major temples on her quest to face him, and when she gets there, she must sacrifice herself and her guardians in order to make him sleep. This slumber is only for a few short years, but during this time, the world can have peace. People can go to sleep and awaken as they choose and not worry about wrath from this dark creature. 
Leveling in Final Fantasy X is vastly different from the previous games. Instead of gathering experience, which leads to stat gain, instead what happens is you get sphere levels. Leveling is done upon the sphere grid. This grid is where you move around and choose which stats and skills you want your characters to learn. This makes it so any character with enough work can be massively powerful in any category you choose. You can make your weakest magic user punch people for 99,999 damage if you want, and if you're willing to spend enough time leveling up. One of the most unique things about this game is definitely the fact that this is the first Final Fantasy in the main series that does not have you walking across a world map. Travel instead is done walking from zone to zone or later by teleporting up to your airship via save orbs and simply choosing a destination. This makes the world feel smaller, but also a lot more personable, because there is no dead space. Every single area is so detailed and so lived in that it's very easy to see all the programming that went into it. I really thought that the story in this game was much more brazenly dark than previous entries. We've had dark Final Fantasy games, but we've never had a Final Fantasy game where we've already lost. The world is already destroyed, and at this point we're just trying to save the few scraps we have left. Final Fantasy X all around is a well-rounded, easily accessible game with a lot of heavy, complicated combat that you can get into. Basically layers and layers and layers, and it's as much as you want it to be, so I think it might be one of the best games to start with. So as you can tell, it's an amazing series. All the entries are all so unique and so perfect in their own way, so really you can't go wrong with any Final Fantasy game. Well, except some of the Game Boy ones were a little bit weird. Either way, if you like this video, please subscribe and share it with your Final Fantasy friends or post it on some forums, but do me a big favor and keep dreaming. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, maybe check out my last video. Please subscribe and if you want, share this somewhere with your friends.